Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today for the second time, episode two. You're such a star to take on this mantle of hosting this session of strong industry leaders of uh, um, and uh, giving them a hard time. Jonathan, it's a, a real pleasure to be back with you for round two of hospitality tomorrow. I can't believe you've lined me up to follow Robin with his, are we at rock bottom? Yes, we are. And uh, as you say, pretty remarkable that Robin can give us those pretty disastrous figures and keep a positive vibe going. Uh, I hope we can do something similar over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, because we're going to be looking not so much at, at the data and, and what's happening uh, on the front line of hospitality right now, but we're going to have some big thoughts about the, the context, the frame in which we have to see what's happening uh, in the industry right now, and that is geopolitics, and it's about um, the big economic picture as well. So I'm delighted to say that you, uh, thanks to you and your team, uh, we've lined up a couple of brilliant speakers. So everybody watching, um, do uh, pin your ears back, because over the next 40 minutes, we're going to have some real insights from two very experienced speakers. Uh, we're going to do them one by one, so I'm in a moment going to introduce our first speaker, but I should, before I do that, just say uh, the whole idea of this is that we give you some big thoughts to take away, but we also want an opportunity for you to ask some questions as well. So um, use the platform to uh, put some questions out there. Jonathan and I are gonna be looking at questions that come up from you guys, and we're gonna uh, get some of them uh, put to our uh, two speakers. So it is interactive. Um, I'll do another questioning myself, but we want you to do it. Uh, I shall speak to you a little bit later on, but thank you very much. Uh, so as I said, two, two speakers uh, that we're going to hear from. Uh, in a short while, we'll hear from Wesley Paul, who is uh, one of the really world-renowned uh, investment managers who spent a long career at JP Morgan, done lots of other things too, but he's been handling people's money and figuring out where to put it and where to make a profit for a very long time. So he's going to be our second speaker. But first up, as I said, we're going to look at the geopolitical impact of uh, the pandemic, what it is doing to world politics, all of the, the different questions that come in terms of global leadership, the tensions that we're seeing uh, across the world, particularly perhaps between the US and China right now, lots and lots to think about. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our first speaker. He is Sir Peter Westmacott. Now he uh, is an extremely experienced British diplomat. He has been British ambassador in Washington DC, in Paris, in Ankara as well. Uh, he sits on various boards now. He's a consultant. He works with the Atlantic Council. It is his job to look at how the world is working today, try and make sense of it. So I'm going to zap my own uh, ugly mug out of here, hand the floor, the virtual floor to you, Sir Peter. Uh, I know you've got some opening remarks, and then I get the chance to quiz you a little bit, and we're going to put some questions from everybody watching to you as well. But for right now, I'm going to hand over to you. A few thoughts by way of opening the discussion. I am not a hotel industry guy, uh, but I am a customer. I have recent experience of going to such interesting places as the Amantora Hotel in Oman, where reservations were being cancelled in droves by Chinese customers even uh, as early as January. Uh, and also going for New Year to the wonderful new museum hotel in Antakya in Turkey, where also people weren't allowed to go because it was deemed to be too close to Syria. So I am very conscious of the terrible threats uh, which have been uh, affecting the hospitality industry uh, for such a long time, but especially over the last couple of months. And all my sympathies are with those trying to make a living at this uh, tricky time. Now, uh, a few broad brush thoughts from a non-specialist. Uh, I think it looks to me, as the previous speaker was saying, as though uh, things are not great, to put it mildly, and they're going to stay like that until one of two things happen. Either this virus dies out, which it doesn't look like it wants to do, like winter flu often does, or we're going to have a vaccine, and everybody's scurrying around, not least some brilliant people in Oxford University here in the UK, trying to find that vaccine, but that's going to take a bit of time. So in the meantime, we are into testing, tracing, tracking, and of course, uh, a lot of quarantine, which is a 
Uh, and the British government of the last two or three days has been talking about applying additional quarantine measures to people coming to the UK from abroad. Some people say six weeks too late, but uh, this may be going to start at the beginning of next month, which will be a further problem, I think, for the hospitality industry. But there are a number of uh, special arrangements being negotiated as we speak, not least with France and other places. So we're not quite sure how this is going to go. In the United Kingdom, from where I speak to you, we are unfortunately kind of European champions in terms of the results of the coronavirus. We have lost more people in terms of, of lives lost, formally speaking, 32,000 deaths. Informally, if we look at the total numbers of excess deaths over the norm, something around 55,000, a very high number, second only in absolute terms to the United States of America. And I don't need you to tell you that um, there's quite a lot of recrimination going around. Did the British government move too slowly? Did it flip-flop? Should it have done more of this, less of that? Why didn't they do track and trace a bit sooner? Uh, and so on. Anyway, I had a great debate. Uh, we're now doing the best we can here. But what I would say as a general comment is that whereas back in the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, it seems to me, and I was in Paris at the time, Prime Minister coming over to see President Sarkozy kind of once a week, seems to me that there isn't a great deal of international cooperation. The G7 hasn't really done the business, although the UK is going to take over the chair of the G7 next and has got some ideas about trying to have a response to the virus problem. G20 uh, has not been effective and even the Security Council of the United Nations hasn't really been able to agree even on how to investigate the source of uh, the virus and how it's been handled. So I think one of the, the points I would make is that every government is scurrying around doing its own thing uh, with somewhat mixed results. Um, there has been some discussion that, well, those which have got autocratic tendencies rather than a full and free and open democracies where governments can't get out of line with public opinion have done better. I'm not entirely sure that is right. I think that the governments which have made a better fist of this have been the ones which were either more methodical or had greater experience of dealing with SARS or MERS or other viral outbreaks in different parts of the world. And some of the best ones actually have been democracies rather than autocracies. So that is to say, I think the Germans have done very well, a few hundred deaths, whereas we've got, you know, um, 35,000 or sorry, a little bit less than that in the United Kingdom. And I think if we look at Singapore, at Taiwan, um, at Korea, they have done really very well indeed, even though there are some signs of the virus coming back with what might be a second wave or might just be a bit of because people go to nightclubs and so on. So I think different governments and a different approach of their scientists, to what extent they're listening to science, uh, to what extent um, they are uh, reacting to other countries, you can't really make a hard and fast calculation as to which government has done a better job of it uh, than another type. Now, that said, I do think that uh, at the global level, there is more focus than there was before on China for obvious reasons. There's been a lot of criticism of how China dealt with the thing. They did then share the codes of the virus. They did then begin to tell everybody else what was going on. But by then, hundreds of thousands of people have got on airplanes from China and gone to other parts of the world. And I think that there are a number of governments, I'm thinking of France and Australia, but there are others too, who have not much appreciated the attack that they've had from China for having either said on the record where the virus came from uh, or have been criticized by China from uh, setting out their own policy responses in a way that's different uh, to what China has done. There have been threats of tariffs through imports of agricultural products and meat from Australia and so on. Uh, there have been threats to France and there was even a letter from the EU ambassadors which was to be published uh, in China, calling for greater cooperation between Europe and China, uh, which had to be censored by the Chinese authorities because it said the outbreak began in Wuhan. All that has come at a time when others are looking at China uh, from a perspective of concern over technology, the Huawei debate we've had across the world, how far should people's 5G technology be dependent on Chinese technology, how is China treating its neighbors, and so on. Plus the way in which all of our industries, as we begin to recover from this terrible outbreak when life gets back to normal, are going to be looking at shorter supply chains, less dependency on other countries, 
far away where problems could arise again if there was a second wave or a different virus. So I suspect that one of the longer term characteristics of all this is going to be people looking to see if they can almost uh, reshore, onshore uh, their industrial and, and trading requirements and be a little bit less globalized, a little bit more, not necessarily nationalistic, but shortening the supply lines a bit less just in time because there's too many risks now to the just in time business model. And I think that's going to be one of the uh, longer term consequences. At the same time as we've got all this going on, uh, let's not forget that there are other geopolitical risks which are out there in the world. We've had the oil price drama, which has caused all sorts of difficulties for uh, many countries. The Russians and the Saudis began it, if you like, by failing to agree on, on production levels. And now Russia is eating through its reserves. The Saudi Arabians are also uh, foreign exchange reserves going down. Where's that going to go? Good news for some consumers, or so it should be. Uh, bad news for oil companies and for stock markets. Some uncertainty still there at the strategic level in the Gulf, although at least the the latest tragedy in the Gulf when a missile hit an Iranian naval vessel in the Straits of Hormuz, it seems to have been friendly fire rather than something which came from uh, another country and therefore was going to unleash further tensions between Iran and its neighbors. But we have to keep an eye on what's happening in the Middle East uh, at all times. And then, of course, we've got the political uncertainties of, let's say, the United States elections coming up on the 3rd of November. We can talk about that later on, Stephen, if you would like to do so. But I think all of us have to look at the reactions of the United States government, uh, the finger pointing, the degree of self-congratulation, but also the policy responses in the context of, of what's going to happen on the 3rd of November and President Trump's understandable, natural uh, desire to see himself chosen by the American people for uh, another term. And then um, I think I would say just a word about the economic damage, which is of where we are at the moment. Um, and that is to say, UK economy looking at maybe minus 25% of GDP in the second quarter of this year. And for the end of the year, probably minus 14, 15%. Global economy, maybe minus 6%, something like that. None of us quite knows because there is such a high level of uncertainty. But here in the UK, 25% of the workforce is furloughed, being supported by a very strong and courageous um, fiscal stimulus program, if that's not the wrong term, from the British government. But there are big issues about how to pay for it and how long it will last. Other governments are doing the same thing. What are we going to do to keep people's jobs, to keep people with an income if their jobs are disappearing, and so on. This is a very big part of the issue and how long do you keep it going how long can you afford to keep it going is something which is out there and conditioning the move at the moment in the united kingdom and many other countries of gradually relaxing the confinement getting people back to work getting a degree of normality uh, back into existence but without risking uh, the progress that has been made to flatten the curve as the experts say uh, and ensure that we don't unleash a second wave of more and more uh, fatalities and new cases of the coronavirus. A last words, Stephen, before I run out of time and uh, you start interrogating me on other things, on Brexit. Brexit is something which used to be the front and center story for British uh, politics and, and newspapers and, everything, and the economy. It's rather faded into the background because of COVID, but it's important right now because within the next month or so, by the end of June anyway, British government has to decide if it wants to extend the transition period, which is essentially the, the practicalities of the UK leaving the European Union. It sounds boring. It is important because uh, if it doesn't extend, the chances of us getting a comprehensive new partnership free trade deal with the European Union by the end of the year are pretty remote. And there is a great big political debate and indeed quite a lot of a sense in body politic here in London that what this government wants to do is, is run the clock out, not have an extension, settle for no deal Brexit, blame coronavirus and to some extent intractable Europeans for the lack of a deal uh, and move ahead without having to pay a budgetary contribution which would be part of the extension uh, without having to sell to the British public a not very good deal. They'd rather almost say 
it wasn't possible to reach a deal, so now we'll make a fresh start all by ourselves. But there will be an economic cost to that, and adding that to the economic damage coming from the COVID-19 means that the United Kingdom at the moment, I think, is looking at quite a lot of uncertainty uh, and uh, a, a worry that the UK economy more generally, leaving aside the hospitality industry, you know, is, is in for a, a period of turbulence for uh, a year or two to come as we try and work through these different uncertainties. I think I'm going to stop there, leave it at that. Lots I haven't said, but please pick me up on all those issues. Uh, thanks very, very much indeed, Sir Peter. As you say, loads to get through there, and uh, uncertainty and turbulence were, were obviously strong themes. Uh, I'm going to just try and ask a few quick-fire questions of you, and, and, and then we'll see if, if uh, others want to get in as well. But I'm mindful as, of your experience as a, as a former British ambassador in Washington. Do you believe it is time for us, as we look at the response uh, to the pandemic and also the efforts to find a vaccine and to work collectively and collaboratively on all of that, is it time for us to say goodbye to many of our assumptions uh, about American leadership in the world? I think there's been a lot going on, Stephen, for the last couple of years, which have caused us to question whether America really is still um, the leader of the free world, so to speak. There have been a lot of policy issues on which many of America's traditional allies have fundamentally disagreed with the way in which the Trump administration has handled things, whether it's been the undermining of EU, a criticism of NATO, um, dislike of free trade, protectionism, America first, tearing up the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, the handling of the North Korean nuclear crisis. You know, there have been a whole series of issues, Arab-Israel peace process, which we'd all worked on for such a long time, where I think there have been quite big gaps developing between uh, this administration in America and where America's allies traditionally have felt they could be. And as a result of that, and this is really what's implied in your question, I think people are looking less to America uh, for the natural leadership role. And there's been talk, but not much more than that, of Europeans and others trying to get their own act together and seeing whether they can play more of a role. But I think during the coronavirus, I think that has, if you like, exacerbated that trend because there has been a sense that this was all about what's in it for me, uh, to quote a phrase used by President Obama yesterday, rather than how can we uh, exercise global leadership friends and allies in order to have a genuinely international response to this crisis which is affecting us all. And it kind of isn't coming through quite like that. So I suspect you are right that we are witnessing the beginning of the end, at least for the time being, of the natural leadership which the rest of us felt that the United States... And, and, and put it this way, if we're specific, I'm just wondering, again, with your experience, when you hear Trump saying that the US is no longer prepared to fund uh, the WHO, when the US uh, government appears to be forging its own path in terms of search for a vaccine rather than acting co cooperatively with others. If you were in your old job in Washington and you were reporting back to London, would you be saying to your political masters, the time has come to really make a break, frankly, with the Trump administration. We need to call this out. And with others in Europe and the Australians and the Canadians and many others, we need to say, we can't work with this guy and we're going to do things co collectively and collaboratively. And if the US doesn't want to come along, then so be it. Well, a lot of Trump observers would. In other words, the sentiment that he is saying is out there and reflecting probably the views of a lot of his base, which is still perhaps 42, 45 percent of the American electorate. The specifics of what he says shouldn't always be taken seriously because he can certainly change his mind a day or two later if somebody so more if it doesn't play too well uh, in the court of public opinion. So I think what, what I would be saying is, you know, this is a different sort of president. This is, this is governed by tweet uh, early in the morning, which often leaves the rest of the administration scrabbling to work out what the boss uh, really wants. I do think we need to engage with them, and I do think uh, we need to call them out. On occasion, British government and others have done that on certain policy issues, foreign policy that I've noticed, Iran and Israel and so on. Uh, and on climate change, you know, we have publicly disagreed and said we think, do not think this is the right thing to do. But make a break with the leader of the free world, uh, as, as was with the biggest economy in the world, where we've got very significant other interests 
defense and security and intelligence and counterterrorism and cyber. You know, there are a lot of issues there where we do still need to work very closely together with the United States of America. And much of that is continuing, even though Trump has been undermining some of the independence of those institutions. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't turn over the apple cart completely, but I would try to engage in, in a... Uh, okay, one more quick one from me, and then we've got some great questions coming in from people watching all over the world. But my other one is about China. Uh, I had my own rather feisty encounter with the Chinese ambassador in London the other day, and the tensions are obvious. We we all know about them, but many people watching this, Sir Peter, will be uh, potential investors in China, and if they're not investors in China, they'll certainly be running businesses that um, have begun begun to rely on the Chinese consumer, the traveler, the Chinese traveler. Do you believe that in the fallout from the pandemic? Our relations, that is Western countries, I guess I mean particularly, our relations with China will be long term strained and that economic integration with China will suffer as a consequence of all of the suspicions and the recriminations that you alluded to. I think there will be a greater tensions in the future. But I would say that we must remember also that China, as well as the rest of us, have done extraordinarily well out of the degree of economic cooperation and integration that we have witnessed over the last 20 odd, odd years. It was, after all, a conscious decision of many of the Western economies with the technology to outsource the manufacturing so that it was nice and cheap to China so that we could have cell phones and laptop computers at remarkably reasonable cost made in China. Now we're getting alarmed because the technology capability in, in China is there and nobody really believes that there's such a thing as an independent private sector that doesn't do essentially what the Chinese state is telling it. And I think some of the language that's come out of Beijing, you know, the threatening languages that I alluded to before, to the Europeans, to the Australians, to some of the other neighboring countries, about, and the lies I'm afraid they've told about the militarization of islands, having promised the United States they weren't going to do any such thing. You know, all this uh, has changed the atmosphere. But China still does very well uh, out of trade, uh, exporting to uh, and cooperating with uh, Western economies. It's, it owns something like $3 trillion of United States debt. You know, it's not in the business of bringing down Western economies. It does have an interest in continuing to work uh, with the rest of the world. But I think that the strategic arguments about the degree of technological dependence, about the degree on, uh, of our dependence on supply chains in China, and I think the way, the, uh, unfortunately, the way that China's been throwing its weight around in terms of uh, building on technological superiority to cause, if you like, dipl diplomatic offensives, which leave other people feeling really very uh, angry and distressed. I don't think this has been very helpful, but I think the arguments for seeking to defend your own interests while managing and engaging with China on the, it, that it also has an interest in engaging with the rest of the world, not in, not in, if you like, destroying other political and economic systems. I think those arguments remain valid. The challenge is how to ensure that works well enough in the future uh, without totally surrendering our own sovereignty and our own ability to remain masters of our own destiny. Yeah, it's a tough, tough balance to find. Uh, so Peter, yeah. I'm, I'm, well, we, we're running short of time because I do want to introduce Wesley Paul in, in, in a very short while because we, we mustn't overrun. But I've got uh, three excellent questions here from people watching. So I'm going to ask you to be extraordinarily pithy. Give me your sort of 10 second answers to each of these. <laughs> okay. Now you're in interview mode. Yeah, exactly. So here's your challenge. Number one, what is it going to take for the British Foreign Office to allow travel to certain destinations once they are open. Now, we all know that the Foreign Office, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, being declared a pandemic, essentially said, don't travel anywhere to British citizens. So what, what's it going to take for the uh, travel advice to fundamentally change? Yeah, I wish I knew a, a clear answer. I think we've got to get into massive testing, uh, something resembling even a health passport, uh, which we haven't yet got. Uh, whether it's through apps or whether it's through some other form of technology, which means that people can travel with the certainty that they are not themselves contagious. And that should allow other countries to let them in. And it should also allow our own country to let them back. So I think if, if the virus itself isn't going to vanish, and I fear it looks like it's not going to, uh, the answer is that we have got to make more progress uh, with the testing, tracking te and tracing technology so that there can be a degree of certainty with people traveling both into and out of the United Kingdom 
um, with, without risking infection of other people. So we're not there yet. Right. Uh, the, the health minister, health secretary here in the UK today said that he basically thought people would have to abandon their plans for elaborate summer holidays. I'm sure you, you would sense that. Well, I hope he's wrong. I know that there are talks going on with a number of other countries, as I mentioned earlier, not just France, to see whether there is some kind of protocol or some kind of uh, health certificate certainty, some uh, checking of individuals so that they can still go to those countries because it's win-win. You know, tourism is vital to the economies of many of these other countries and it's vital to the mental health, if you like, of people who've right. paid a lot of money well, for their summer vacation. Yeah, so we'll see. Yes, good. You're being pithy. You've got to be even pithier now. This is a great one. I want 10 seconds. What is the future of the EU going to look like, weaker or stronger, in 10 seconds? It's looking weaker at the moment because of the problems within the Eurozone and the inequalities between the strengths and weaknesses of the different economies and because of legal battles which have now begun between whether national states or the European institutions have superiority in terms of law. So it's problematic, uh, but economically, I think the European Union, uh, led by the stronger countries, will be bouncing back, uh, I hope, like the rest of us. And a final one on China, which we just discussed, but in brief, with an inevitable China blowback, are we likely to see greater Chinese international acquisitions via proxy businesses, that is sort of front businesses that in essence are acting on behalf of the Chinese state? Is that going to be something we should be looking for in the future? There are signs of a lot of very close partnerships developing between the Chinese state and public money and very big Chinese companies in order to secure strategic, industrial, commercial, technological advance. There are also signs of China using the weakness of the global economy to give lots of money and infrastructure support to other poorer countries in Africa and elsewhere and seeking certain conditions in response. So I think we are going to see China flexing its muscles uh, both domestically and abroad and the rest of us need to be on our guard against that and seeing whether we can engage with rather than have to fight against uh, that tendency. So Peter, I, I wish we had longer because I'm sure everybody watching will agree there is so much more ground and I am now going to endeavour to introduce uh, our second keynote speaker for this particular session. Uh, he is Wesley Paul. He, many of you who follow finance will know him because of a very long career in global wealth management, a very successful career. Much of it uh, was devoted to his work with JP Morgan. Uh, he held various senior positions there for a long time. He was head of uh, JP Morgan Global Investment. He now sits on various boards. Uh, I note also that he's uh, the chairman of one of Britain's great museums, the Armouries in Leeds, because he is the proud owner of a fantastic collection of historical firearms, which I hope he's not going to point at me through his camera over the next 15 minutes. But Wesley Paul, welcome to you. you. Uh, we want you to give us your take on uh, the damage done to the global economy, how it might recover and how it might change. I'm assuming everyone can hear me well, so uh, I'll just get going. Um, Jonathan and Dirk Backer pulled me aside uh, a couple of weeks back and said, Wes, would you mind talking in this, uh, this conference and uh, would you mind delivering all the bad news about the economics and the uh, financial markets and then maybe leave people with a bit of hope at the end about what technology is doing to try to get us back to normal. Let me, uh, let me try and do this in the 10 to 15 minutes that I've been given. I've got a lot to, so uh, I've been around in the financial markets for 40 years. I started uh, after the first oil shock in 1975 when interest rates were 18%. And I've lived through a number of wars in, in the Gulf and uh, second oil shocks and a whole bunch of other things. Um, let me say to you that I have never seen a combination of problems that exist today at any time in my working life. And certainly as I look back, I don't think in modern history. Remember the crisis we had for 2008 was largely a financial crisis. This one has everything, all of the ingredients of being another financial crisis, but it's actually a much deeper problem because of the nature of the, 
the factor that caused it, which is obviously the coronavirus. We are in complete unprecedented territory. I think if anyone tries, any of us that is trying to look back to try to find data points from which we can start to understand how markets or how economies behave, we don't have them. So we're sort of flying by the seats of our pants in terms of looking at what the challenges are that lie ahead. We are in the middle of a full pandemic. We have been count, found completely unprepared for this, even though many of us have been talking about a pandemic risk as one of the big risks that exists out there. Most of the world's economies, as we've seen from previous speakers, are in complete lockdown right now. And as Peter was just saying, there is no policy coordination. The G7 have not been talking openly. The G20 certainly haven't. And further than that, some of the important organizations that we have come to count on, the IMF, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, have not as been as strong, have not been as uh, prominent as many of us would have liked them to be. One of the core challenges I'm gonna talk about is the fact that we're still not out of the virus problem. This virus is still um, very difficult to understand and it is changing every day. So as we are approaching this, this moment when we think economies are going to be released and lockdown is going to end, there is a considerable amount of fear still out there that once the lockdowns that we're in right now end, we go through a second wave of infections. So that's just sitting there waiting as a second shoe to fall. There is no vaccine on the horizon. Vaccines take a long time to produce. We're working with a company that actually is looking to develop one. The typical timelines are six, seven years to go through all of the processes. We can shortcut those processes. But if people are waiting for a vaccine, it isn't going to happen this year. It may happen next year. And understand when we do develop a vaccine, we have to have health workers administer it if it's an injectable vaccine. And this is going to require a lot of people because we have a lot of people to vaccinate. And then if you look at across the globe, every country, every industry, and practically every family, has been impacted in some way. So we have a long road to recovery. And then finally, as we look at some of the worst data we're challenged with right now, um, unemployment, and that's one of the ones I'm worried about, unemployment is spiking to a level we've not seen since the Great Depression. And one of the factors I'm gonna be looking at is how quickly the levels of unemployment start to fall once the lockdown ends. One of the big challenges for us as individuals is we humans have become very accustomed to being in control of our own lives. And there is at no other time in modern history that all of us have felt so out of control. So the psychological impact on behaviors, I actually think it's gonna remain with us for, for some number of years to come. And that's going to affect all sorts of things, which I'll touch upon in my talk. So where do I start? Let's start with the economics. Um, it's been said that the Nobel Prize is the only prize that two people can win with diametrically opposite views. So um, I'm going to give you a share of some of the views that I've been reading from various organizations. And all of you, I'm sure, have been covering the news every day, seeing what people's thoughts are. Um, the estimates for the global financial impact, they're huge. At the lower end, they range around three to four trillion US dollars. At the upper end, a whopping sort of 20 trillion dollars. To give you the context of that, the whole global GDP is about 87 trillion dollars coming into this in 2020. So even at the lower end of that range, global GDP is going to get hit very, very hard. Our views and the median views that we're seeing right hit of about five to seven trillion dollars but understand that that estimate is based on the lockdowns ending around now and that there is no second wave 
that puts us back into lockdown. And remember, when we think about all of this, um, it's happening at a time that we were already falling in terms of economic performance. Uh, Peter talked a little bit earlier about um, Brexit and the challenges that that has uh, faced for Europe and indeed the rest of the world. But as we entered this phase in 2020 when the, uh, the virus hit, we have to remember that uh, global economic performance was already falling and was already of great concern. We've never really recovered from the 2008 crisis. Trade tensions had become evident, not just between the US and China, but between the US and practically everyone else. And then amongst all of that, one of the big concerns people like myself look at is actually the credit risks that exist in the market. And credit risk remains high, and this pandemic has only made it much worse. And then when we look across the world, um, you know, the, the engine of growth, China, has been uh, slipping in terms of its economic performance. Even Germany, going into the crisis, was already falling in terms of its economic uh, performance. So the challenge we've got here is this pandemic struck at perhaps one of the worst times possible. And it's only accelerated the problems that we're going to see. Um, now, along the way, it hasn't been helped by we picked up, and I think a couple of the speakers mentioned earlier, an oil crisis caused largely by uh, OPEC's own, own incompetence. But remember, as oil prices fall, this affects a whole bunch of industries. It affects a whole bunch of people with significant buying power. And again, another blow to economic uh, opportunity. Now on the positives, I'll talk a little bit about the positives. Governments have been responsive. In fact, in some cases, very responsive. The total amount of stimulus we see right now is about 10 to $11 trillion with of course the United States as usual, leading at the front and the EU as usual, hesitant, uh, disagreeing and disappointing at the back. We will need huge corporate bailouts. We're seeing some of those already in the airline industry and in the tourism industry, but even in industrial companies uh, as well, we're going to see a number of significant bailouts. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna have to see some sovereign bailouts as well, not just in the emerging markets this time, but you might start to see some important European countries needing to go to the IMF if their colleagues don't help them. Um, some countries will do better than others, um, we see the U.S. actually recovering uh, fairly quickly into 2021. And indeed, if you look at the IMF forecasts, the IMF are forecasting some pretty dire numbers in 2020. But what they are forecasting is a pretty healthy bounce into 2021. There's a bit of psychology going on here because they got it very wrong in 2008 when they were expecting a much flatter outcome. And now they're actually um, going for a slightly stronger outcome. So the numbers are pretty challenging. Peter mentioned some numbers earlier, but global growth, the IMF thinks we're going to shrink by about 3% this year, bounce back globally to about 5.8, 6%. The US is about 4.7% of that growth. The euro area is about the same number, 47 um, and remember, both of those economies, the U.S. contracting something like 6% this year and the EU euro region contracting about 7.5%. Only two economies of the major economies this year will post positive growth. China with about 1.2%, very low relative to their own history, and India about 1.9%. Um, China bouncing back next year to something like 20, uh, like to, I think, 9.2%. Now, um, I guess the, the, the question I would have now is, is, you know, how do we think about the challenges that lie ahead uh, with regard to this economic backdrop um, and indeed uh, the virus that we're still facing? Remember, my talk is about two components. It's about 
the economic situation and then about how technology is responding. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the virus and rather uh, I'm going to save time, Stephen, for you to give me questions on that later. But let's talk about some of the developing technologies that we hope gets us back to normal. And that assumes that you've got this economic backdrop that's pretty ugly sitting behind us. And in the meantime, I would say to you, the technologies are coming in to provide a degree of coping strategies that helps us to start to move back to normality. But um, the question is going to be, how much can they help? Now, the first thing I need to make clear to everybody, this virus, even when we find a vaccine, is not disappearing. It's going to change and it'll become a different virus next year. There'll be COVID-20, there'll be COVID-21. And what we have as a society have to become accustomed to is a world where the winter flu is actually more dangerous than it's ever been. And that is a new normal. And the idea that there is some silver bullet coming over the horizon that's going to fix this problem and someone's going to fire a gun and everyone goes back to normal. We need to forget that as, as, as something that's likely to happen. Viruses mutate. It is in their nature. The studies we're reading now suggest this virus has been around for several years. It's only recently found its perfect host. And it's now adapting to its host. And that host, unfortunately, is us. And it's likely that this adaption that we see coming forward will make it harder for us to manage these coping strategies. So what can we do? Well, the first thing I think we need to ask is, what is the right question? I've seen a lot of stuff in the press. You guys would have all seen it too. Everyone on the call would have seen it. We've heard things about people talking about um, temperature testing or UV uh, light or drinking Dettol or whatever it is that people have come up with ideas that would fix this problem. The reality is that's not the right question. We hear in the hospitality sector about how do restaurants cope with spacing tables further apart? How do hotel bars work with putting the bars further apart and making people stand two meters away from each other? And in an office building, I know people are working on apps that are trying to reconfigure the desk layout so that desks are spaced between each other. And of course, in an aircraft, people are trying to think about what's the impact of taking out the middle seat. Well, the reality is all of those are the wrong question. The right question is how do we deal with the individual? How do we look at individuals and how do we understand whether they are COVID free, they're COVID positive, They've had COVID and they're now immune, or they've had some sort of a vaccination that gives them a level of immunity. And if that allows us to have some form of a health passport that can give the individual the confidence that they are in fact COVID free, I think all of us in this call would love to know that we're COVID free right now. And if you're going into a restaurant, the restaurant would not need to change its business model if it could somehow know that everyone was coming in was COVID free or COVID negative. So let's find ways for technology to accomplish that. And that's the right question because the technology exists. We can test people, we can give them an electronic tag to certify it, and that can allow them and permission them to do things that otherwise they couldn't do. And when you look at a building, and if you're going into a building and you are carrying this card, and the card has said you've been certified as being COVID free on this particular date, you swipe it, it lets you in. Part of technology. Wesley, I, great. All right. So I'm just, I'm very much thinking of our audience around the world working in hotels, hospitality, leisure, aviation, all of these sectors. Seems to me your analysis is, if we're honest, extremely bleak for this particular sector, because it's a sector that has thrived in an open, globalized economy. And it seems to me 
everything behind, implied by what you are saying is that that is going to be very difficult to recreate in the next year or two or three. Uh, simple answer, yes. Um, we have short memories. So I would suspect in four or five years that people will start to adjust to the new threats and to learn to live with them. Vulnerable people will naturally limit their circle of friends um, and people will find their own levels of, of, of how much they want to be out there. But the reality is if we are in a new world where a virus like uh, COVID-19 will persist, then people's risk factors have changed. And if, you're risk, if you move risk, you change behavior. So yes, I think it's going to be a while. The economy itself is going to come back, but understand that the behaviors might, might, might lag. And if you were an investor in this sector, and over many years you've looked at this sector amongst many others, would you be now trying to find uh, businesses that are very flexible, adaptive and responsive, and are perhaps shifting away from a model that relies on huge waves of sort of international tourists, maybe focusing more on national markets, maybe moving away from tying up with, you know, uh, for example, the Chinese consumer, if they're a long way from China. We, you know, how would you play it if you were investing in this sector right now? Look, smarter, smarter people than me have, have, have made clear investment decisions. Warren Buffett dumped all of his airline portfolio. And this is a portfolio that he'd only just invested in a few years ago. And he took a big loss on that. And his comment was, I don't understand the business anymore. Okay. Now, so if Warren doesn't understand it, how do, you know, what chance does someone like I uh, myself have? I would say to you the following, Stephen, uh, markets go up and down. Uh, every time there's a crisis, I remember sitting in there at JP Morgan, standing around when everyone's got their head in their hands, thinking the world's going to end. The reality is the Asian crisis, the dot-com crisis, 9-11, I could go back and I will tell you over a period of time, things come back. Investors swing from greed to fear. Uh, at the moment, it is completely stuck, the needle on fear. But the stock markets don't show that. The stock markets are actually saying, you know what, things are okay. In fact, they're actually saying earnings are going to be okay because that's the last shoe to fall. Because the macroeconomics we know are not good, the politics are not good, and uh, the uncertainty is not good. I will tell you that corporate profits will look bad for a while, but they'll recover. So to answer your question, uh, this sector will come back because humans are naturally gregarious. We want to be out there. We want to socialize, uh, enjoying life. And what we will do is find ways to do that. And there will be some permanent changes in some areas, but a lot of those areas will go through a period of change and come back to some normality. I would be looking to buy uh, some companies when they get cheaper, uh, but not anytime soon. And I think, you know, the, the, there's a lot more pain in some sectors to, to be had. Just let me to ask you a final one, Wesley, which is, You've worked all over the world, New York, Hong Kong, London. Do you, if, if we're to be a little bit crude and talk about sort of winners and losers in the post-pandemic uh, world, we know Europe's been badly hit. We see the weakness in the United States as well. Are we looking at this exacerbating shift in economic power to Asia, do you think, in, in the long run? Simple answer. Uh, there, there's been a, a, a significant trend anyway of wealth moving from Europe to Asia. And that wealth transfer has been happening for a number of years now. Um, and Europe, as we all know, the, the, the EU in particular, um, are not helping themselves because they've created a, what they think is a, a large market, but they've constrained themselves so much and have actually become quite uncompetitive. They are very skilled in a number of industries, but they're not as competitive as they need to be. And that competitiveness problem has been around for a while. And Asia will benefit from this. Um, 
The weakness that Asia has is, is political leadership and political coordination. We don't see any of their leaders except President Xi. Uh, we have Abe every now and again raising his head, but I would challenge people on this call to name the presidents or prime ministers across the Asian countries. And the reality is, you know, that we don't see them having that political leadership yet. We talked a little earlier, and then Peter is obviously as ambassador, and he's actually my colleague. We talked about Donald Trump and, and this administration. But I think if we look back to um, previous administrations, we'll, we'll say, look, you know, the, the Americans are good, good people, good leaders. And the one thing about the American economy, very agile. The Federal Reserve is a, is a wonderful institution. So long as it stays independent, it will act. And they've been very quick to add stimulus. So I think what you'll see is uh, perhaps a, a three-speed world uh, with the United States and Asia doing very well. Europe is the laggard. Um, I really don't know where we're going to sit in this in terms of Britain. And then, mm -hmm. you know, hold a thought for emerging countries because emerging countries are going to suffer in this because most of them depend on resources, oil, um, and these things are in low demand. Yeah, there is so much to chew on from all of that, Wesley. Again, like I said with Sir Peter, if only we had more time, we could drill down even deeper into this. But I think you've, again, but when they open the lunch, the, the restaurants, lunch one day will be perfect. You, you got yourself a deal. I'd love that. That would be great. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I know people around the world will have really uh, been listening very careful to your analysis. So we thank you for it. I'll say bye bye for now. Uh, so thank you to Wesley. Uh, I'll also pretty much say goodbye because my uh, hosting of this particular panel is drawn to a close. We are running a little bit over time, and I apologize for that, but I think perhaps it's been worth it because we've had some, some pretty serious thought and insight from our two wonderful panelists. So thanks to Sir Peter, thanks to Wesley. Jonathan, I can see you uh, waiting in the wings, uh, so I'm going to hand back to you. It's been a pleasure to be involved again, so thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Stephen.